All right, let's jump right in. This is the first video of the new series on object-oriented Java programming with generative artificial intelligence. And I am really excited to be doing this course. So, my name is Steven Wireman. Uh, you may have uh, just stumbled on this channel. Uh, I had been doing these sorts of tutorials way back in the day. Uh, got away from doing it. Now I'm back to doing it. And this is going to be the first video in a series on Java programming uh, using ChatGPT as a programming partner and a virtual private tutor. So I encourage you to visit the website. The link is in the description. If you are interested in signing up for the full course, because we're going to be doing a lot. There will be a lot of it that will be available for free on this channel. Uh, but the full course will give you access to uh, extensive uh, materials, the course materials that I'm using to generate this, all of this, and um, weekly webinar sessions with me. Plus, there will be a final project where we take everything that we cover in the course and apply it to something practical that you can use or put out there. So let's get on with it. I'm going to share my screen and open my slides. Um, screen share. And there we go. All right. So a little bit of an overview. Uh, I'm going to talk about why I'm doing this approach in this way, why I'm using generative AI. We're going to talk about why objects first. We'll talk about what objects and classes are. We'll talk about how to plan an application. And we'll talk a little bit about how to use ChatGPT and all of this and the importance of code review when you are using generative AI to create code. You will need to know what you're looking at and whether or not it will work. You can't just assume that it's going to work the way you want it to work. So why this approach? Well, let's talk a little bit about what computer science is. It's a very broad subject, but computer science is ultimately the application of computing technology towards solving human problems. And there are, you know, other uh, areas of computer science that may not be as directly practical, things like um, things like theoretical computer science and understanding uh, more abstract systems and the um, general categories that we might put those systems into and how they function. Understanding how to optimize uh, various algorithmic solutions to problems, uh, which can be a very practical application, but also understanding when we encounter certain computational problems that cannot be reasonably solved in a reasonable amount of time. And when we encounter those sorts of optimization problems, understanding uh, that uh, we might have to make good educated guesses to get close enough to a reasonable solution to our problem. Then we'll look at some of those a little bit later. Uh, but in general, computer science is about solving human problems. It's about 
not just number crunching, but also information and data management. And generative AI really changes how we relate to information. And as the generative AI tools continue to improve, software developers will benefit from using these tools for not just brainstorming, but also code generation, project organization and management, as well as generating clear and accurate documentation. These tools are not going to replace you as a programmer or software developer. Your role will be to take uh, user requirements and translate them in such a way that you will be able to wrangle the computer to work in the way that the client needs it to work. And AI provides us with new ways of achieving that goal. And the focus of this series will be primarily using those tools to build and design our applications. Most of these tools have some API that allow us to relate or interact with these applications, uh, with these uh, LLMs, with these platforms, uh, through our application. We're not going to be focusing so much on that. We're not even going to be focusing on the tools that are specifically designed for code generation. We're going to be working with the chatbot interface of ChatGPT uh, to uh, do all these things. And there's a reason for that. I'll go into it as we get on with it. So let's talk about objects and classes. Now, Objects are abstractions. And if you think about what an object is in the real world, uh, you can uh, start to understand how we represent these objects in the computer and how we can make use of them. So, for example, the go-to example that I usually use when I teach this sort of class is a book. Now, a book is an object. This particular book is one of the textbooks I used to use uh, when I would teach uh, computer science, uh, Introduction to Computer Science Programming at the university. And this is Introduction to Java Programming and Data Structures by Daniel Liang. This is the 11th edition. It's a very good Java book. Um, very thick, very uh, exhaustive, uh, covers a lot of good stuff, and it covers it in a very clear way. I recommend it, but it's not going to be required for this course. Uh, but getting back to my whole point, a book has certain attributes that make that book that book, such as the title, the author, the publisher, the edition, the year, the city published, the ISBN number, the list price, all of that. All of that are various attributes that make up that book. And so an object would be a representation in the computer of all of the attributes that make up that particular object. So you'll see uh, with Java how we might represent something like a book in a program. And for one of our examples today, we'll throw together a real simple program that will prompt the user to enter all of the data that constitutes a particular book object instance 
and generates, we'll say, the uh, MLA-style uh, bibliographic entry. So it could be the start of a program that might be a uh, bibliography management tool or some other uh, research notes management tool. So we'll do a simple example of that today. So objects have attributes, like I said. They also have methods. Now, methods define the various behaviors of an object. So if we're representing, say, a webcam, like the webcam I have here, there might be various attributes uh, <clears throat> that um, tell me something about the status of the webcam, uh, say, uh, what's the focus setting of the camera, what's the uh, current resolution setting of the camera, is the camera on or off. So those various attributes would be associated with our object, but we'd also want ways of working with those attributes, those properties that are a part of our object. Uh, and those would be the methods, and that defines the various behaviors of the object. So a method for our webcam would be something like turn on, turn off, adjust the focus setting, uh, turn on the light, turn off the light, blink the light. Uh, those are actually separate functions from the web camera itself. Usually, your web camera, the light will turn on when the camera is on, and the light will turn off when the camera is off. However, a lot of web cameras have those as separate software functions. This is an important thing to know because it means that if you have a compromised system, it's a bit, little bit of a tangent, a little bit of a security tangent, uh, but if something is up with your computer and you have a compromised system, if you have some sort of malicious uh, program running, it's possible that your web camera could be turned on without the indicator light being turned on. This is why a lot of people uh, have little stickers over their webcam. Uh, or uh, if you have a uh, webcam that has a physical shutter uh, or a physical switch that allows you to turn it on and off. Um, so good things to know. Uh, but back to the subject at hand. Uh, objects are abstractions. They consist of methods and attributes. We define what an object looks like by creating a class. And a class is a blueprint that defines all the methods and attributes that are associated for all the objects of the same type. So, for instance, to represent this book in our application, we're going to create a book class that will have all the attributes we listed and will have methods for setting and getting those attributes. And we'll look at that a little in, in a little bit. Now, the Unified Modeling Language, or UML, that is a standardized visual language used to document the structure, behavior, and interactions of a software system. For our purposes here, UML class diagrams are a very useful pen and paper representation of classes and uh, the underlying or, or the associated objects with that class. So we'll take a look at some of those. Um, I'll probably uh, just throw up a few real quick or I'll um, have uh, one of the chat bots generate some for us. Uh, so let's jump in and do some examples. Um, we could have, I, I don't feel like doing the car example, might come back to that another time. Uh, but you could talk through what a car 
class or car object would look like. So you have make, model, year, then the vehicle identification number, um, how many miles uh, on the odometer, all those properties that one would associate with a particular instance of a car or a particular um, car object. All right, let's uh, jump in and have chat GPT generate examples of student and book. And this will give you an example of how we can use these tools to uh, generate uh, code. So I'm going to go to ChatGPT here, and I am going to ask it to create a Java class representing the bibliographical information. Um, for a book, it should contain a title, which will be a string. And I'll talk about these different, these various data types uh, in a little bit. Author, which will also be a string. So a string is just a uh, collection of characters. So a string of characters represents text data uh, in our uh, application or in our object. All right, so we got title, author, publisher, which is also a string. Uh, we'll make a year an int or an integer value. Uh, we'll um, Usually location published is another one. Um, we need ISBN. Um, then I think that should do it for the attributes. We'll say it should contain the following attributes. Um, it should contain uh, accessors and mutators for each attribute. These are the various methods that um, we use to access or get the values stored in each attribute and um, mutators we use those to set or change the value stored in each attribute so it should contain the appropriate accessors in mutators those are also called getters and setters uh, it should also contain constructors. Um, a two-string method. And a get MLA citation method that returns the bibliographic um, entry in MLA format. Uh, it should also contain a main method to 
demonstrate how the class works. And you'll see that a lot of this may look a bit cryptic, may look a bit verbose. Um... But if you look at it enough, it should start to make sense. But a lot of this, a lot of this is boilerplate. Much of this is something that uh, could even be generated by a simple IDE uh, that doesn't have AI backing it up. So most of the modern integrated development environments that um, a developer may use when creating uh, an application uh, has the ability to generate these sorts of uh, accessors and mutators. And like I said, they're also called getters and setters because they always start with get and set. And they do exactly what they sound like. They get the value stored in that attribute, or they set the value uh, for that attribute. So this is the book class, and every book object that we create with that book class, you can see that's the class name, book, that is the object variable, so book, that is an uh, instance variable that references in memory where this new book object is stored. And we'll talk more about how that all plays out uh, later in the series. Um, but for now, all it's going to do here is create a instance of um, book and it's referencing effective java by joshua block incidentally i think it's how it's spelled block no i do not have that book it is not one i have handy right now i i do have a number of books that i just kind of collected and uses different resources but um yeah so you can see what that looks like and we can copy this and i'm just going to open an ide uh let's go with netbeans i think i have that installed here netbeans is a good one uh it's pretty easy to set up easy to use I'll record a separate video on how to set uh, these, set some of these tools up. So we're going to create a new project. I'm going to call this, uh, let's do Java application. We'll do Java with Ant. Uh, we'll call this book. And we're not going to create a main class. I'll talk more, or actually we are going to create a main class, but we are not going to, um, we're not going to use a package. So we're just going to create the main class in the default package. I'll talk more about packages in another, in a later module. All right, I'm going to hit finish. And... 
we end up with this um, very empty uh, boilerplate code. And I'm just going to copy-paste what ChatGPT generated. Uh, very little by way of comments. Comments are these things here. And these are not things that the compiler, that the computer will pay attention to. Comments, uh, typically in Java, will start with two slashes. There are other kinds of comments, um, multi-line comments. Um, but it's strictly text that is ignored by the computer and is only there uh, for anyone who might be reading the program. So we've got this main method to demonstrate how the class gets used. We've got this method to generate the MLA citation, which looks actually pretty good. Uh, everything here looks pretty good. We can test this. Just hit run. And you'll see it prints out the two-string method, which gives us all the information. It prints out the MLA citation. Um, not entirely correct, because I believe MLA should be last first, but it's correct enough. Um, I, it's kind of forced to do it this way, because um, we just have the author name set as uh, one string. So, that is our first very simple Java program. And it's a bit more advanced than uh, first programs usually are. Uh, because we can use these tools to generate the code for us. Uh, all we have to do is make sure that we have at least some understanding of it. And one thing I would suggest, uh, you saw what I just did here. I typed out very clearly what I wanted. And I got this response, which was actually pretty decent. Uh, but what I would suggest doing is um, don't just copy the code and paste it into... Uh, onto your machine. You can do that, and if you do that, you should read through each of these things. And notice how, say, every line here seems to end with a semicolon. That's an important thing to notice. Every statement in Java ends with a semicolon. Um, but just at this stage, get a feel for what's going on here. So a constructor um, constructs objects. It creates new instances of the object. That is, it creates new objects of the type book, in this case. So you see that this constructor We've got, in parentheses here, a whole list of um, parameters. Those are values that we will uh, send to this constructor when we use this constructor. And those values will be used to initialize the new object we are creating. And the way we do this is the way we reference each attribute for the object is by using the this keyword. So this dot title refers to that title attribute. You can see it highlights that there. And title here, because it doesn't say this dot, is going to refer by default to whatever value we sent to the constructor when we called it, when we used it. So you'll see in the main method, 
using the constructor. So down here, using this constructor, the first value passed is effective Java. And you'll see one thing that uh, IDEs like to do is they'll put in a little bit more information um, that helps you see what's what. So the first argument, the first value we are sending to our constructor, so the first thing that comes after parentheses is effective job. And that is in quotes, that is a string, that is just text data that will be assigned to the argument title. So the title of our book is Effective Java. The author of the book is Joshua Block. The publisher is Addison Wesley. The year is 2018. The location published is Boston. And the ISBN number is that. All right. But you see title, author, publisher, year, location, and ISBN. Those texts, that's not actually in our program. By that, I mean if I go back here, you see it just lists the values. It doesn't show what those values get associated with. The only way you know what those values are associated with looking at the program is to look, okay, what order do those parameters appear in? So hopefully all of that made sense. I know it's a lot to take in all at once. If you have to go back and rewatch what I just rambled on about, do so. Uh, also, you can read through uh, some of the, uh, can read through the output here and read through each of the methods. Uh, please, I could even ask it to expound on it. Please add, uh, let, let's just ask for, please explain what each method does. So you can see here, it's walking me through each of these. And there's no real magic here. It, it just tells me in plain English what each of those methods done and you can see kind of how each of these work. All right. Let's go back to the slides and talk about how um well let's do another example before we jump into that. Let's talk about how we might represent, say, student data in a student uh, database program. So what attributes uh, would we have to, I'm going to close this project for now. So what attributes Uh, would we have to keep track of? And I'll call this student database. So you can see a little bit how all of the stuff starts to come together. We'll create a main class called student database. And we're going to create a separate Java class called student. What does student look like? Well, let's ask ChatGPT to create a student class.
will ask the class to contain information about student name. We'll separate this out. First name, last name. I'm not even going to provide, um, we'll say that there's an ID number. Uh, I'm not going to provide the uh, data types this time so we can see how ChatGPT infers um, what that should look like. Major, uh, minor, and um, let's put in birth date and um, year. We'll call it class year, so we're clear about what year we're referring to. So, let's just see. That's a bit of a vague prompt, but let's see what it comes up with. All right, and you can see... We've got a little bit more here. We've got something interesting, an import statement, uh, which is probably used for the birth date. Yep, local date. Then this part looks pretty familiar. Gathers and Sethers are going to look very similar. Then we've got main method to demonstrate class usage, which is nice. That gives us a little bit more of an explanation this time. Didn't just generate the code. So that's nice, and it probably wouldn't have done that. Um, or it might not have done that if I didn't ask for more explanation in the previous prompt. So what I'm going to do, this, for these sorts of simple examples, uh, the code that gets generated is likely going to be okay. You still want to take a look at it. You still want to make sure that there's nothing that looks too, too weird. And I know at this stage, it's gonna be, it, it probably all looks a little bit weird, because if you haven't done this sort of programming before, um, this is new stuff. Um, but if you look at it enough, again, it should start to make sense. So here, you can see our example, student John Doe, uh, student ID, one, two, three, four, five, six. Computer science, mathematics, um, birth date, uh, 5 15 2000, and he is a senior. Let's, I think I hit copy. I'll do it again anyway. Let's go to student. I'm just gonna replace what's there with that. And because this has its own method. I can choose to run uh, this. I want to run student database because student database doesn't do anything yet. But we can run just that program by itself. There should be a way to do that. Student.java. Well, I'm going to do this the uh, easier way. I, I say that easier way. In that, um, I'm going to jump into my console here and just. Oops. 
change to the NetBeans project. We'll go to the student database and we'll go into source directory. And I just, again, want to show you that this works. So I'm going to compile and run this here. Java C, student Java. Java student. And you can see there's our student data. All right. Um, I know there's a way to do it here. I just really did not feel like trying to fumble and find that. So now that we tested that, I'm just going to delete the class file. So to understand a little bit what's going on here, when you write a Java program, you're writing text. So you're just typing out this sort of English-like thing, this human-readable thing that the computer uh, can translate into something that can be read by the computer or can be used by the computer. So that is what a compiler does. It takes your human readable program, the program that you wrote or the program that uh, the uh, AI generated for us, and it translates that into something that the computer can use. So in the case of Java, it will translate that into what's called Java bytecode. And that Java bytecode can be executed using a special interpreter called the Java Virtual Machine. Now, the cool thing about that is that that allows you to write applications that will run on different kinds of platforms. So if you have a uh, Windows machine, or if you have a Linux machine, or if you have a uh, Mac OS machine, if you have an Apple, um, if it runs Java, and all the modern devices do, uh, then you can, with minor tweaking in some cases, but in general you don't even need minor tweaking, you can run your application on those different platforms without having to uh, remake them for each platform and recompile them for each platform. So that's what makes Java so awesome. Uh, that and it's been used fairly widely pretty much since the turn of the century. Um, so there is a fair amount. It, it's well established in the industry. You cannot go wrong knowing how to create Java applications. All right. So we've got our uh, student database here. Um, I can close that. That's the old output from the last application. Let's actually do something with this. And what we'll do is we're going to um, create a simple program. Then we'll I'll do this by hand and um, talk you through some syntax and some of the aspects of Java while I do it. So we're going to need uh, a scanner. Uh, we're going to need something to get input from the user. And I'm going to 
add the import statement for that. And basically what this did is that it created a new object and this object has special methods that will allow us to get data, to get information input from the end user. Uh, so this will allow us to get keyboard input. And we're going to read in each of these things. Um, I just want to see how we use local date. So we'll need local date as well for this. So I'm going to add that import as well. No, it wasn't util, it was time. java.time.local date. So what we can do is we can create uh, variables, and variables are just, um, all we're really doing is assigning a name, a location in memory, and a type um, that is we're specifying what kind of data we're storing uh, at that location in memory and associating with that name. So we can have a variable string for last name. And we can create multiple variables. We're going to need one for last name, first name. Uh, what else do we have here? Uh, ID number. And all of those are strings. Major, minor, birth date, and class year. Pretty much everything was a string except birth date. And we'll need something for a uh, local date for the birth date. Um, to make things a little bit easier for us, we're going to have an int for month, day, and year. So actually we don't even need the variable for the birth date. You'll see why in a moment. Now we'll ask the user to enter all of this information. And the way we do this is system.out.println. And we'll say, please enter student information. So simple prompt letting the user know, hey, this is what this program is doing. And now we can actually get this information. And I'm going to just read in uh, each of these. So, uh, well, let me prompt first what each of these is. Last name. I'm not even going to say enter, just last name. And then we'll do last name. We're going to assign that the value that the user types in. And we get that value from next string. Actually, I'm sorry, it's next line. So that'll take everything the user types in up until when the user hits end. Do the same thing for first name. 
next line. And again, we want to prompt the user. Notice I'm using print. And what print ln does is that it's going to print out this line and then it's going to add a new line character. So it'll print the line and then whatever gets printed next will end up on the next line. The cursor moves to the next line. So then we print out last name, colon and a space. And since it's print and not print ln, it's not going to move to the new line. So the cursor will appear right after that space. And then the user typed in their last name. We can do that for each of these components. ID. Major. Minor. And class year. And we'll get that as well. Now let's get the birth date, month date, and year. And this is going to be a little bit different. Um, so the way this will work. And I forgot the quotes there, so I'm just going to throw that in real quick. So, birth month, that is still going to be, uh, that should not be print LN, that should be print. It would still work, it would just move the cursor to the next line. Um, and the user input would then just appear on the next line. So, enter birth month, and this, the way this will work, is we're going to set month, month is an int, that is an integer value, and we're going to say that's equal to in dot next int. So that says the input that the user types into the computer at this point should be an integer. If it's not an integer, that's going to give us some problems, and we'll see what that looks like. Uh, let's do the same thing for day and year. And I'm recording this rather late in the evening, which is why I am remarkably inconsistent with how I'm doing this. But uh, hopefully, uh, hopefully it's not too disorienting. And then year equals in dot next month again. Uh, now, we can create a new instance of student. 
um, and that's going to equal new student, and we're going to pass to it. name, first name, um, I want to be sure I do this in the right order, first name, last name, so I've already not done it in the right order, first name, last name, ID number, major, minor, And then we've got uh, birth date, and birth date is a type of local date. So I do. I'll do it the same way they did it here, which is yep, local date dot of. going to do year, month is month, and then day of month is day. And then finally, uh, class year. And that should do it. And we can actually reference this by just printing out what was in student. So now the terribly exciting program, it just reads in all this information and prints it back out. But it shows you how we can, one, get information from the user, and to represent that information in our application in an organized and meaningful way. So let me run this, and hopefully I um, don't run into any problems. Uh, last name, first name, uh, ID, major, minor, last year, uh, say senior, birth month, uh, I'm going to make up something, uh, let's say I was born in uh, January 1st, uh, 1926, I am not that old, but you can see that uh, it did, in fact, read in all that information uh, and put it in our object. And you can see that the output of this is the same format as what is here and as what was spat out when I ran this class directly. So, that is another example, and I will have uh, these examples uh, available uh, to look at. Um, well, I'll have them available in the course, and um, I, I may put them Maybe I'll put them on GitHub or something. All right. Let's go back to the slides. Because um, let's talk a bit about how uh, we might go about designing a program um, or an application. And the first thing that we do is we're going to get the requirements uh, that we need to meet 
for our application to be useful. So what exactly does the client or end user need? What should our application do? And then we start to think about how we want to do that. And so we start to design based on those requirements. And most of this is done pen and paper. Um, you don't just want to jump in and start writing code. You want to think about how you're going to organize your project. Um, asking ChatGPT to help you organize at least the sorts of things that we'll be doing early on in this class series uh, is a good way to start to flush out what application design looks like. All right, and then we start to implement this. So we create classes and we write code or we generate code. Um, then we have to test it. Does it compile? Um, that is, does it actually pass through the compiler correctly without generating any errors? So programming languages uh, are very structured in how you write the programs. And if you do something minor, such as forgetting a semicolon at the end of your statement, that will cause an error. And you can see even if I save this and then I try to recompile everything. So I'll just hit clean and build project you're going to see that it gives me an error here. Um, and it will tell me exactly where that error is. So that error in this is in the student.java class on line 8. And if I click on that, it will take me right there. But I'm already there, and I can just put the semicolon there. And now I have fixed my problem. I can save it and it's all good. So that's a compile error. A different kind of error, uh, a runtime error, that's the sort of error that we encounter uh, if our program compiles correctly but doesn't necessarily work correctly. So it could be an error that causes our program to crash or it could be the sort of error that causes our program to generate incorrect results. Um, and we'll look at examples of that as the course progresses. But the point is, uh, if it compiles, um, then great. Uh, if it doesn't compile, we have to go back to step three and find, okay, where's the problem in our code and fix it. Uh, if it doesn't work correctly, if it's generating incorrect results, and we'll see examples of that later in the series, um, then we've got to maybe rethink uh, some of our design aspects of our program. Maybe we made some wrong assumptions about how a certain formula works, for example, or about uh, what we're supposed to be representing in the machine. Could, could be any sort of thing. Uh, we might have to go back to design, or we might have to just look at uh, our implementation, maybe we uh, just entered some formula wrong. And again, we'll dive into deeper examples as the class progresses. Uh, if everything is great, then we deploy it to the client or end user. Likely there is going to be some sort of maintenance, updates that are needed, new specifications that need to be met, uh, or bugs that just slipped through our initial tests. Uh, there might be edge cases that we didn't consider that we have to uh, test out and see uh, what we can do with that. Uh, so we might have to fix what's broken or release patches or updated versions as necessary. So this is the basic uh, waterfall approach to software development. Uh, it's kind of foundational 
it, it's the steps that we go through to understand um, how we create these applications. Uh, there's Agile development, there's Scrum, there's DevOps now, and um, we're not going to go uh, too deep into that in this course. Um, important thing is just understand the overarching steps of what we're doing and why. Moving on, let's talk about how we create classes with ChatGPT. And you saw a couple of examples of how we do this. And some key things to keep in mind when you do this is that you need to provide clear, detailed prompts outlining what you want to model. So if you look at the sort of prompts I wrote here, um, I listed each attribute uh, that we needed. And ChatGPT was able to infer a lot based on the sort of class we're representing. Uh, and you can see up here, uh, I was a little bit more explicit about the types. And ChatGPT made use of that. So if you're not getting the results you want or the information you want, keep iterating. Back to here. Refine your request as necessary, building upon the previous output. Suppose, for instance, we decide we want to represent multiple majors and minors. I might ask, how could I, how could we modify our student class to represent that a student might have more than one major and or minor. And you can see that it recommends changing the fields from string to list string. Now we're going to get something a little bit more involved. but it's very similar. And you can see what it did there is that it created a list of two majors there and list of not just a single minor there. So now majors and minors are represented by lists instead of just strings. And again, I know this first lecture is kind of like drinking from the fire hose. Uh, I really recommend trying out some of these examples for yourself and really, again, reading through the code that gets generated. Um, the more you do this, the more it will start to make sense. Uh, don't get too bogged down in the details. Just kind of take it all in at this point. One thing I strongly recommend is don't just copy paste, but actually try to type out these examples. So you can copy paste and print them on paper, or even write them out on paper for the shorter ones, and then actually type it out into uh, your IDE. Uh, and if you need help setting up an IDE, I'll be recording a video very soon about how to do that. 
I'll cover Windows and Linux. Uh, I don't have access to a Mac, so I won't be covering that. But it's not that complicated. And you can find information online, not just YouTube, but uh, other uh, resources. And I'll talk about different uh, development environments uh, that you may wish to explore. All right, this video has uh, gone on long enough. So let's uh, just wrap up a bit. Um, important thing to re remember about programming, important thing to remember about computing, and about uh, propped creation, that is about customizing how you ask uh, your chatbot to do what you need it to do. Remember, garbage in will give you garbage out. Uh, if you type in something that is nonsensical, that is contradictory, that is um, not terribly concrete, not specific, not clear, you're going to get stuff that's not useful or usable. Uh, in the case of ChatGPT, if you ask for something, and, and you've probably encountered this in many, many other forms on many other videos, if you ask for something that doesn't necessarily exist, but your question frames it in a way that it can assume it exists, it's going to make stuff up. So it is still, uh, we are still dealing with the hallucinations problem, uh, AI hallucinations. And I'll talk a bit more about how LLMs work uh, so we can explore why that phenomenon happens and how we can catch it when it does. It doesn't mean that these tools are useless. It means that these tools have to be used in a specific way in order for them to be useful. That's all. All right. So if you provide clear, specific requests, the result is pretty much magic. Not really magic, but it's wonderful. Uh, iterate, that is, try something, see what you get back, review what you get back, verify what you get back, make sure that it makes sense, make sure that it works. And if you run into problems or if it's not quite what you expected, iterate, try again, customize your response, get more clear, more specific. This is why chat uh, generative AI is not going to replace software developers because computers will always need people who can take the sort of abstract and nebulous requests of end users and customers and make that into something that is concrete, planned out, and usable. So knowing how to use these tools well is how you get ahead in using them well because they have already become ubiquitous. They are already being used pretty much everywhere. Might as well get a head start on using them properly. So that takes us to the end of this very long and rambling video. I hope you found it helpful. Uh, and if you feel like this was drinking from the fire hose, uh, we'll start to uh, explore uh, in some detail some of the more basic things about um, how to create Java programs. So uh, don't let yourself be too overwhelmed by this. Uh, just keep exploring it and check out the videos that will be coming ahead. Uh, and check out the link in the description if you are interested in signing up for that uh, 
online course. Um, I will see you in the next video. And good night.